Sunday night edition of the Crash the Pond podcast. Folks, we are back. We are back. It's been a busy week of Ducks hockey. We've got four four games to talk about. Some wins, some losses, some records being set, some games that the Ducks would rather forget. Um, the one thing that none of us will forget today, though, is that it is National High Five Day. So, Jake, I'm giving you a virtual high five. High five. Virtual high five. There high you five. go. And so as I continue my bit, you continue your bit of a colorful shirt on, I mean, on the on the stream. I mean, it's a little bit of a bit. It's also just because, you know, got, gotta gotta like at least make uh, the visual aspect entertaining for the people. You you back there just with your gray shirt, you know, boring old gray <laughs> shirt over there. Nothing fancy. One of us has to at least provide some visual element to uh, make the people laugh, to entertain the people. As uh, Christian, I believe, last time in our Twitch chat, uh, gave me props for my shirt. So, you know, have to uh, have to entertain the people. One of us has to, at least. Okay. Well, hey, I I only feel slightly called out there, so good job. <laughs> I mean, good, um, good that it's only slightly, because it was uh, fully called out. <laughs> and also, for those that are listening on Monday, uh, happy National Hanging Out Day. So if you were thinking of hanging out, go do it because uh, it's it's the day to do it. So anyway, with with all that, thankfully in the rearview mirror, let's uh, let's move on. Let's move on. Um, Jake and I actually, this was probably going to be a good hint at uh, the kind of week it's been for the Ducks. Jake and I spent, I'll call it maybe sixty five percent of our prep time talking about soccer news. So it goes to show how eventful of a week it was. For the Ducks. I mean, there's massive news on the soccer front, though. The Super League was officially yeah. announced. And yeah. who knows what's going to happen there, if it's actually going to happen, if it's just jockeying. It, I mean, the, the biggest thing out there for anyone, and this is the only time I'll really talk about it, uh, the entire, like, soccer or in European soccer as we know it, European football as we know it, could be thrown on its head with this. Yeah. So it's it's big. It's important. Uh, it has nothing to do with the Anaheim Ducks, though, so we will we will quickly move on. But remember, we, we will... but remember the the Ducks said Fulham was their team over over summer. Remember when that was a thing? Did they remember when that was a thing? As Fulham was fighting for promotion, I I don't remember that. Yeah, but I also you know it's not really something I pay a ton of attention to, uh, as you might expect. Let's uh let's talk about this week though, because there I think there were some interesting things that happened. Yeah. During this week, I mean, let's uh, let's just go in chronological order. How about that? Let's do it. I mean, unless you had something else in mind. No, nope. I want to. I want to be. I like. We're planning. Chron- we're planning on the fly here, essentially. I like chronological order. You're the one who always tries to go against it. Well, usually there's a bigger news item that I think is worth addressing just right away because it's probably what people want to hear about. But this week there isn't really that. So. Let's just uh, let's let's take it all the way back to Monday night on the once the dust had settled on the trade deadline and, and Jake was just in complete shambles about how the day had gone and, and his morose tone in our last podcast. Uh, the, the Ducks maybe gave him something to celebrate. Who knows? Uh, as they defeated the San Jose Sharks, blanked them for nothing. And really, though, I mean, the. The story in this game was Anthony Stolarz, who started a net and set a franchise record for the number of saves in a shutout with 46. So as you can imagine, it's not like the Ducks put up 50 shots in this game. They got outshot 46 to 21. Stolarz absolutely stole the show, stood on his head, and the Ducks gave him just enough uh, little, enough run support, bar a little baseball n- analogy there, to get it done. Yeah, this was... Uh... This was not a good game for the Ducks. Let, let, <laughs> let's go with that. I mean, if you look at expected goals in all situations, they allowed over four in, in all situations from the Sharks, 4.58 to be exact. Uh, I believe at, at five on five, it was only 2.95. So not great on the p- penalty kill in addition to kind of their, their bad five on five play. And this was a game where Anthony Stola has just absolutely stood on his head. I mean, let, let me just show everyone real quick that the heat map. Uh, I mean, the only thing that you'll say that's a, a good news for the Ducks and bringing back uh, showing things on screen, by the way, have it all yeah. set up again. So you've been, you've been off your game. I have been. So we're back. Uh, we You can all see this on your screen now. Um, but the heat map for the Ducks, the only benefit that you can say is that it's all kind of right. The majority is right in front of the net, which 
I guess if you're going to get outshot, that's a good thing that all of your shots are coming there, but still not great as compared to the Sharks just getting shots from all over, including a lot right in front of the nets. And so this was a situation where um, Anthony Stoller just absolutely stood on his head and he is the only reason why the Ducks were in this game. Yeah, and and to be fair, the, the the Ducks were opportunistic. I mean, they scored three goals in the first period, so they they put goals up on the board. It, it doesn't hurt when you're playing Martin Jones. Uh, Max Contois picked up the first goal of the night, his twelfth of the season. A nice feed from Derek Grant, actually a really nice assist on that goal. And then Alexander Volkov uh, picking up a pair of of goals. I mean, just kind of greasy goals. You know, nothing really that you can point to and say, yeah, that was, you know, like a highlight real play or anything like that. But as we'll get into with the next game, Volkov three goals in that, in that San Jose mini series, and including uh, a, a, an assist on the grant goal on Wednesday night. So, I mean, he's shooting, he was shooting 40% after the series. That's, that's so come de- down def- since definitely sustainable right there. Right? Definitely sustainable. Uh, but I mean, how much stock do you put into his production so far? I mean, here's the thing with, with his production. And we talked about this a little bit during our, our watch along uh, w- with various different things. But I mean, he he's found himself in good positions to be able to open himself up for shots. I'm thinking kind of his first game with the Ducks when he put himself in a good position to receive passes from Comtois, uh, was able to score one and, and not... Uh, or score one of them and missed on the other, but he's put himself into a really good spot to, to put the puck in the back of the net. The only thing is that 40% shooting is not sustainable, even for the, for someone getting themselves into good spots. And so uh, for anyone out there uh, buying stock in Volkov, just because of the goals that he scored, I would <clears> caution <throat> you against doing that because he's not going to keep going at this rate. Um, so I, I think he's done a good job of that. I think he's done a decent job of getting in on the four check. Yeah, I think he's I think he's been solid defensively too. You know, yeah. he's 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 been breaking up plays. He is somewhat physical along the wall. Uh so that would be the aspect that would give confidence and optimism, not necessarily the goal scoring. And yep. especially, I mean, not to take away from the goals, but some of them, I mean, he's just hacking at the puck in front. They're going in. You know, it's not necessarily like a goal scorers type goal, which is fine. You know, everybody can you can score in different ways, but I would, I would, like you said, caution to anoint him as, uh, you know, some some top flight producer for this team. But really, the highlight of the night for me was the glove save by Anthony Stolarz in the first period on Timo Meyer. I mean, a block shot, and he gets across and just mm-hmm. snags it out of the air. Pretty, pretty nice. Yep. And Anthony Stolarz uh, had an absolutely fantastic performance. I mean, he set a record for the most saves by a duck in a in a shutout performance. Um, had an absolutely stellar night and you actually have a a little bit of something coming, uh, coming, uh, to everyone on Anthony Stollers, right? Or do you want to keep it under wraps a little bit and leave it as Uh a tease? Uh Oh yeah. That's a major tease. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll talk, maybe keep listening and maybe we'll talk about it at the very end. Uh, but yeah, got something special there in the works that hopefully will be, uh, will be out very soon, but yeah, so he was fantastic. And I feel like we should just do a little Anthony Stollers segment here, uh, because he was, or do you want to get through the next game first? Let's get through the next. Let's get through the next yeah. game because I mean, Solar okay. Solars would, would end up getting another game, and I believe yeah. the interesting thing yep. this was the game that we did a watch along for was Dallas Akins went out of his way to basically mention that this game for Stolars was not a scheduled game for him. That yep. when they they looked and planned out things, basically this was a game he gave him because of him getting the shutout in the prior game, and so I mean, good on Dallas. I mean, he he kind of hasn't utilize Stolarz as much as he probably should have this year and so good on him to recognize that might as well give him another game here because I mean at the end of the day here's the thing with Anthony Stolarz as compared uh to uh to Miller is that Ryan Miller I think we can both probably agree this is probably his last year at least his last year with the Ducks I, I think yeah. that that's a fair fair assumption to make so with that being the case Anthony Stolarz this is his audition so if you're Dallas Akins I mean Maybe you're, you're thinking that you you're not necessarily secure in your job, but I think as a coach, maybe you you have to be thinking you're under contract. You're going to be back next year. You want to get a look at Anthony Stolarz, and so it really, I mean, this is the same concept as I think we talked about with Zegers. I don't know if it was last episode. I don't know if it was the Patria. We we did a lot of podcasts last week, and so, um, but it just benefits the Ducks. It benefits Akins. It benefits everyone. Actually, Jake, th- this week. 
Was that's it? all been that's all been this week. Yeah, it's it's been it's been a crazy <laughs> week. But, yes. But regardless, it just benefits them to understand what they have to get a look in these no in these games that essentially yeah. don't well, matter. Hold on. Are we doing a Stolars bit now or are we talking about the game? Just just clarifying. <laughs> Cause, I mean, cause we're... It, it was a mix. It was a mix. Okay, yeah, let's, go, okay. Let, let's go into the next game. You're but, right. But You're yes, right. But, but, but I'm glad that you brought that up, though, on the fact that it wasn't scheduled because Dallas Higgins went out of his way to say that. And he also went out of his way to say that John Gibson is chomping at the bit to get back in net and that he's, you know, a competitor. And that was actually, I think, going into Friday's game. But the point is there, maybe maybe ruffling some feathers here that that Stolarz is is getting some additional starts. Now, in the game on Wednesday, the one that we did a watch along for, um I mean outside of Stolarz being very solid, I don't think he was quite as um quite as spectacular in that game as as he was in the first game. I mean, didn't didn't go out and set an, another franchise record, but he did still make 27 saves on 28 shots and I would say the other person who really stood out in that night is Troy Terry. I mean, he was fantastic on Wednesday with the primary assist on the opening goal of the night on Ryan Getzlaff's feed there. And then just throughout the game, drawing two penalties, posting strong five on five numbers. Uh, I know that we've been singing his praises all season long, but look, it's absolutely warranted. He's getting it done on the ice. And it's interesting going back to Aiken's comments, like you brought up Aiken's went out of his way to praise Troy Terry uh, during one of his avail- availabilities this week, saying how, you know, Troy Terry's become one of the most responsible players in the team, how he's really proud of his season. And I do find that kind of, kind of ironic yep. just because I think that Troy Terry has always been a responsible forward on this team. I, that's probably the one thing he's always done well mm-hmm. is he's been, mm-hmm. he's been, he's been solid in terms of, you know, holding up his end of the bargain without the puck and managing the puck. Maybe some people will quibble with the turnovers, but that's never been the issue. Uh, It's just been how much offense can he really generate? And it's funny that now that the points are piling up, now that he's maybe on a little bit of an unsustainable kick, who knows? Now he's getting praised for being uh, the responsible forward, which, hey, regardless of how Dallas Aikens arrived at this conclusion, good that he did because... Now Troy Terry is basically immovable in this in this lineup, which, which is, is good. which is where he should have been. I mean Troy Terry. I mean you and I have talked about this a bunch. I I think there has been a, a genuine improvement in his game with certain offensive aspects throughout yes. throughout the course of the season. I think that it, it's important to note that, but I don't think that it's this vast jump that he's made in his game that that a lot of the people in the mainstream media would make you think. A lot of what he's done in his game is very similar to what he was doing earlier in the season. Like I said, there has been an improvement offensively, but defensively, this game has always been there. You look at a lot of his stats in in terms of kind of percentage or percentile of war uh, for defense, and that's really what he's always thrived in. And what you've seen this year is a bump up in his even strength offense uh, in terms of uh, generating offense for the team. And and so it's really nice to see him kind of take advantage of this because, I mean, at the end of the day, Troy Terry is starting to enter kind of his prime years. I know that might sound a little bit premature Premature with him being, I believe Troy Terry is uh, 23, going to be 24. Um, let me but just, yeah, this is it. Yeah, this he, is the he, he's 23. He's going to be 24 at the start of next year. He's a September birthday. And so this is his prime year. So if this is what he is and he's able to put up 40 to 50 po- 40 points or so, which I think is the pace that he's on this year. I'll let me double check that real quick. But if that's what he is for the Ducks team and he's kind of a second, third line talent that that is really strong defensively is good at driving some offense also for them. That that's really beneficial. I mean, he's at 16 points in 37 games right now this year, a little bit unsustainable. Sure. But that's a 35 point season right there. And 35 point season for a guy making 1.7 mil. That's really 1. good. 1.4. 1.4. 1.45 1. 1. 4, 1. for the next three seasons for, for this. And then two more after this one. That's, that's really yeah. good. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. He, if he keeps this up at all, and even if the points dip a little bit, that's still, you're still getting a ton of value for that contract yeah. if you're the ducks. And so I will say that, you know, I, I definitely think that he's closer to being the, the player he's always been than just some newfound player that, that the Ducks kind of stumbled into. But there is an element of his game that has improved, and I think is he's trying more stuff out there. He's, he's more creative with the puck. He's more aggressive in challenging defenders one-on-one, and especially when he's coming out of the corner down low, he's trying to take on defenders and you know get them off balance, 
I mean, you kind of saw that on the assist on the Getzlaff goal on Wednesday night. And I don't think that that's something that he's always done. I think sometimes he's been a little caught up in just not turning it over, getting it back to the point. That's actually something that showed up in his passing data from last year in Corey Schneider's database that he's really good at, pa- at just entering the zone, but then getting it back to the point. And I think now he's using those opportunities he's getting because he's always been great at entering the zone, but then he's using that to get into the dangerous areas more often. And look, it's, it's turning him into a very complete and, at times dangerous hockey player. Yep. And I, I think overall also if we're, we're going to, we're talking about this game. Um, I, I, the ducks played a better game in, in the second game against San Jose. The first yeah. one, the first one they won, you could say that it was because of Stolarz. He was the, the primary reason, uh, expected goals for 4.9, I think was what I said. So basically, uh, Stolarz was 4.9 goal saved above expected, uh, a little Salem appearance on the podcast right now for everyone there she out is. there. Um, and so, um, Anthony Stollers was very good. Yes. Do you want to say anything about Stollers, Salem? <laughs> Salem's trying to get in on the action. Yeah. Um, For those who can't see, she just she just put up her her nose to Jake's face yep. as he's trying to speak here, and now she's trying to climb up the window. Yeah. So yep. all par for the course yep. of, yep. of cat ownership. Yep. About right. But um, <laughs> so Stollers is four point nine six expected goal uh goal saved above expected, which is insane if you think about it in that perspective that if if you put in an average goalie a, a league exp- or an uh yeah average goalie he would have allowed nearly five goals in that first game against the sharks mm-hmm. and that was the game that solars had the shutout so and he blanked them <laughs> yeah and so in the second game much much better overall from the ducks 2.82 expected goals for from the ducks only 2.07 against and that's in all situations and so basically uh solars was still very good about a goal above expected um, but they didn't need him as much. And I think that's a good no. sign because at the end of the day, that's what we look at by looking at expected goals is sure. Obviously goaltending is a big part of it. That that is a player on the team. That is an actual talent that you can have if you have a good player, but you don't want to have to rely upon that as your crutch uh, to be able to win games. You want to have that kind of in your back pocket, but be set up to win games. Even kind of, if you just get league expected or expected goalie, basically an average goalie throughout the league. Exactly. And and that's the thing, though, with with Stolarz, and we'll, we'll get into this more, but even just being slightly above average to average this season for the Ducks goaltenders has not always exactly been the case. Now, one other performance I did want to highlight from this game, because once again, Alexander Volkov picking up a goal in this game, uh, he would he scored in much the same fashion that we've seen him do this season. But I think there was a little more there. I mean, he he managed to get into the slot and was able to corral a bouncing puck and shovel it into the net, won a battle to get the puck and, and win control. Did the same thing on the assist he picked up in this game. So I thought it was a good kind of complete game from Volkov in this one as well. Derek Grant also picked up a goal, deflecting home a point shot, which I know you love, Jake. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> one, one that, it, would you call it deflected when it was shot off his leg? Well, that that's literally what happened, but I don't know if it was intentional. Um, so, yeah, I think overall this was a, a solid effort from the Ducks. They got good performances from different areas of the lineup. You know, we talked about Troy Terry, Volkov, um, Grant picking up a goal. Stolarz was good. Um, now, I think one thing that we should talk a little bit about, or I don't know if you want to hold off on this, is how Hayden Fleury looked in his no, first well, couple well, games with well, the Ducks. Let's jump into it, because that was also kind of, we, we buried that, that a little bit, but... Hayden Fleury jumped on a private plane on Tuesday to fly from uh, Carolina to San Jose to join up with the Ducks. That way he was able to to not have to deal with any of the quarantines, if anyone was wondering about that. Uh, basically, if you don't go on a charter plane, you don't have to deal with all the quarantine issues that uh, uh, the league has in place. And so that allowed for him to jump right into the game on Wednesday with the Ducks. Um, and so he made his debut, and he was paired with Kevin Shattenkirk in that game, and that's the pairing that we've seen kind of for the rest of, of the uh, of his game so far this week. So what were your thoughts on him in this first game? I thought he was fine. Uh, I don't think he did anything really that spectacular. He did a good job of getting the puck out of the zone. There were a couple times where he had mm-hmm. to skate it up on his own. There were a couple times where if he didn't see anything, he would just swing it back over to Shattenkirk, which isn't a terrible idea because yep. Kevin Shattenkirk is a good puck-moving defenseman. Now, the one thing that did happen a couple times – maybe a little more than you would like is that he did get caught just kind of either zoning out in the neutral zone or just making a bad pinch, a bad read. And that led to a couple of sharks 
uh, scoring chances and rushes. And so I don't know how much of that is actually in his game where he gets caught in open ice, or if it's maybe just a matter of being on a new team, being in a new system, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt for sure there. Um, but he is a good skater. He moves well. Uh, he moves well laterally when he's when he's uh, skating backwards, which is always an important trait for a defenseman. He generates speed skating backwards with crossovers. Uh, so look, the mobility is there. the The puck moving ability, I'm still kind of, I'm still not 100 percent sure about. He looks but, fine and he looks good. Yeah. In, he looks solid in the D zone in terms of puck movement, in terms of being able to break the puck out of the zone. I think that that's one thing. The only concern it, was it, he he took a penalty in this game that kind of came from him getting caught a little flat footed. But then again, yeah, he had just flown across the country. That happens. Um, I, I think the one thing that I, the opinion that I think I have after this game, and we'll talk about more in the, the follow-up games, um, I don't necessarily see him as a, a power play guy. I know that was one thing that was part of the the conversation of the trade. I believe that Sarah Sivian even had a quote basically saying he he's a guy that could potentially look to get power play time if he's in, in a different team that's not as stacked on the blue line yeah, as the I, Carolina Hurricanes. And I, I haven't I, seen that. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't see that. He doesn't necessarily have the flair for the offensive zone. He's a guy that I think is good at keeping the puck in at the point, but he's not a guy that's going to create offense from the blue line. But I, that's not necessarily what you were trying to get with him. And he's a good puck mover from, from, yeah, exactly. from outside of the blue, from getting it out of his own D zone. Well, that's the thing is I would just caution everybody to not rush to see what he can do on the power play or see what he can do on the penalty kill. If he can just be what he was in Carolina, which is just kind of an slightly above average third pairing defenseman who can maybe play on the second pairing for the Ducks, that's actually a pretty big addition. Because if you think about the, some of the depth defensemen that they've had in recent years, uh, I don't know why, but the name Jacob Larson comes to mind, among others. It hasn't been exactly this awesome crew of depth D-men. And so to have a guy who's just solid, who's just okay, th that that's already good enough for this yeah. team, especially because the acquisition cost was so low. That being said, Yanni Hockenpah scoring goals over there with the Hurricanes already. I mean, so. here's, here's the thing with Yanni <laughs> Hockenpah. As, as two guys who have not necessarily sang his praises, we've also said a lot of times he's a guy that as a spot, as a sixth defenseman could be very valuable on a good team because mm -hmm. of his ability in the defensive zone. The issue with the ducks was he was a, a guy that was a kind of considered a, a top four defenseman, top pairing at time on the ducks, which yes. is a little bit of a miscast or miscasting of just, him, misuse just of him. a little bit, just, just, a little just, bit. just a tiny bit. Uh, but yeah, so I think with flurry, he does, he does have that mobility. He's probably even though the stats say he's a ton better offensively than uh, Yanni Hockenpah, it's kind of a small sample thing with Hockenpah. You know, we don't we don't have that much data on him. He hasn't been in the NHL that long. Um, I haven't seen a ton offensively from Flurry. Again, it's just a handful of games, not even a handful of games, where I'm not sure how much he can bring on that end. But in the other two zones, neutral and defensive, he he looks solid enough and especially next to Shattenkirk, I think you also get a little more out of Shattenkirk this way, yeah, which is important. I, I think, I mean, uh, DB Lauer, you know, Twitch that says, here here comes the Sweden slander. So might as well just say this now. Wait, what? Hayden Fleury is, a, is a, he was talking about Larson. And so might as well just say uh -huh. this. He's definitely an upgrade on Larson. Oh, 100%. I mean, that's not even, I mean. Not even there's a question. A, there's, there's a lot of defensemen in the NHL. A lot of defensemen who would be an upgrade over Jacob Larson. And that's the thing is him being added to this team is not awesome news for Jacob Larson because that's that third pairing left D spot. That's been where Jacob, J Jacob Larson has slotted in throughout his Ducks career. So Larson did play today. He was on the right side next to Cam Fowler, which uh, surprise, surprise, you know, is maybe not the best move, but. All in all, I'm I'm, oh, well, I'm 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 quite I'm quietly optimistic about the uh, the Hayden Flurry experiment so far. Let's get through the the other two games and then we'll get into the discussion that we were having before the pod about misuse of defensemen on their wrong well, side. Well, I did just want to quickly say, okay, uh, bef before we do that, that just in terms of the Anthony Stolarz discussion, yep. uh, look, he's been awesome. Has he played elite teams? Has he has he been in these Vegas games? No, but he's provided the Ducks a level of goaltending that, quite frankly, they, they haven't gotten a lot of this season. And it's just five games. It's it's not he hasn't had to deal with the wear and tear of the season. But to come off of the taxi squad and to look as good as he has to really make it look so easy and so seamless. 
it's it's really remarkable and i just you know i wonder now with the ducks in the expansion draft if you're seattle i don't know when you're looking at this ducks you know group of players that you can take i don't know who really sticks out to them there there there's not there, there's not a name at least to me that i would think a team would just really be jumping at getting uh and so there's going to be a ton of options for them in net but anthony stolars is going to be one of the cheaper options yep and and i don't see the ducks you know not protecting and, john gibson yeah and, and i mean you and i took a quick look at the list of goalies that are going to be available and it's not exactly a laundry list of elite yeah. talent and well that's I mean, the thing and, 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 and some it's, of the... it's a lot of it's a lot of names and i think people people see that list and they think oh well look at all these great goalies but when you look at how some of them have played in recent years which you can bet seattle is also looking at I don't think they're going to be fooled by that. And I think also some of the bigger names, who knows if they're going to be available because I mean, one of the names potentially out there is Hudobin. And I mean, here's the thing is Dallas going to protect uh, Ben Bishop over Hudobin. What are they going to do there? Because Ben Bishop has been hurt majority of his time in Dallas. And that contract is basically its own protection uh, <laughs> clause. So, I mean, that that's the thing that's going on. And I don't, I actually would need to double check. I don't know if Ben Bishop might have a no move clause that would uh, keep that from happening, but Regardless, I, I I I think you're on the right path. That maybe Solars isn't this like sexy name. He's isn't this big name. He doesn't necessarily have the sample size behind him. But he's one of the few prime age guys with a little bit of a of a track record in the NHL. Not a huge one, and a guy that maybe you take a risk on. Maybe you bring him in to be your backup. That potentially with eyes towards the next year or two of being a starter in a tan or you have a one A one B tandem with him and someone else uh, moving forward. And so. Um, I, I don't think it's completely out of the question that, uh, that yeah. Seattle takes him, but I, I don't know if I consider it likely. I, I think, well, yeah, that, that, that's the thing. I think it's, it's a bit of both, right? You shouldn't dismiss it out of hand that this is just, that this is just no way this is going to happen. And you also shouldn't probably rush to say, oh yeah, look at Stolarz. He's for sure going to Seattle. Okay. Now. So fire Carlisle, uh, fired Carlisle adds in the Twitch chat that Ben Bishop does indeed have a no movement clause. So that, that is, so they, so have, to they have to protect him. him. Um, so fair point there. Um, but I mean, here's the thing. I think if it, I think from a duck's perspective, losing Stolarz is one of the best outcomes from the expansion draft. Uh, I mean, yes and no. I, I think that that's not like a crazy take, but the ducks have struggled to have good backup goaltending, well, good goaltending. Hear, hear me out here on this. The reason why uh -huh. I say that is he's a player that as DB Lowry in our Twitch chat says, he's, he's a little bit of found money. And yes. so he's a guy that you that's signed, reasonable. you signed out of nowhere. It's not as if someone you've put a lot of draft capital into, you put a lot of, uh, pro you've put a lot okay. of development time into and all this different type of stuff and you're losing him for nothing. And so, and I don't even know if I honestly, if Stolars would have gotten you that much at the trade deadline either. Cause goalies are weird. no. So I, well, he also just has little to no track record, and, and which so that, is the issue. So I, I mean, obviously, I think it's un, it's lower on the totem pole for for Seattle taking him, but I think it's well. well do you, do you think it's such a given that they take like a Josh Mahura, for example? Cause, I don't because I because I I feel like there's a lot of chatter that that is uh, that's kind of being you can pencil that in that they're taking Mahura. I, I think, and and if you're Seattle, it's a fine pick. He's uh, yeah, a guy who has potential. Yeah, I I think. I think Josh but, but, Mahura might be the most likely. It also depends on how the Ducks do it. I mean, the Ducks... But he's also, he's also a 22-year-old defenseman who's kind of stuck in the AHL. Well, so where I was going this is is it also depends on if the Ducks do 7-3 if they go 4-4, four, four, which I... with Or eight skaters. I'm actually now of the opinion that I think the Ducks go 4-4 four, four and a guy like a Max Jones or, or some might get left exposed. And I think I could see Seattle taking a Max Jones uh, for him. And so... Um, yeah. Like, I, I think that th those are realistic options. And so, I mean, the thing is, I think Stolars is, is an option. I don't know if if the options are Mahura, Jones, or Stolars. I think Seattle would probably take, like, Jones or, or Mahura over Stolars. Well, but, who, who, but, it all, but who knows? It depends on who's available to them as at the goaltending position. Well, exactly. And it, even at the defense and forward positions. Like, yep. a lot of, so much of this is dependent on what they can get from other teams. But I just think... On paper, in a vacuum, if you're the uh, Ducks, I guess that you're maybe less concerned about losing Stolars than you are at Jones well, or Mahura because those are and homegrown picks, right? Kinda, and so there, there is some investment there. Kind of circling back to my my point I was making before we started talking about that second game, even more reason to, to play Stolars more. 
Like, like, why not run him out? Play him as your starter for the rest of the games to see if he can, like, if he ends up playing well, great. It builds up his value. Maybe Seattle takes a look at him. Maybe it saves a guy that you've put a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, draft draft capital into, or not draft capital, but a lot of uh, development time into all, all this different type of stuff. And, and uh, you aren't going to lose that guy as a result. And so there's just so many benefits to playing Stolars. I'm well, just, I'm yeah. confused why they haven't done it more, honestly. Well, well that's always been it takes a puzzling foresight, one. I guess. Wow. Okay. Um, well, I mean, the thing is that's more confusing is right now they know he can play that well. And the last two games, sure, Gibson has started, but Stolar isn't even backing up, which I find kind of kind of interesting. So I think what's going on there, and I would need to backtrack to double check, and so give me a second, and I'll double check that. I would assume that Gibson had a little knock or something like that, that that basically they were utilizing the emergency loan condition to call oh, okay. up Anthony Stolars, and so once Gibson was healthy, they had to put him back on the taxi squad as a result okay. of that. See that that would make more sense because if it's just purely on merit, I don't know why Stolars wouldn't be in in the lineup, let even me, if it's just a backup. Let, let me double check that. I'll get that. No, that 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 does sound correct because I remember perusing Cap Friendly the other day. Do you want to move on to the Vegas games, or should we take a moment here? Uh, let's take a moment here. So, by the way, it looks as if it was not an emergency loan. So. Oh, take that, so, for, take that for what it what you want. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, I'm I'm going through the transaction list, and it doesn't the send down wasn't um, called emergency loan. It was just to taxi squad. So, yeah, I, I think it's time we we heard a word from our sponsor, Felix. Do you want to take it take us away here? Really, you're putting this on me. Yep. Okay. Well, you'll you'll get the middle portion, and then I'll I'll I'll, I'll close things out here. Uh, okay. Flowers are blooming. The grass is growing, and it's time to chop the weeds. Thanks to our sponsor, Manscaped, you can trim your holes safely and efficiently. I'm talking about ball trimmers. Manscaped, the global leaders in men's below-the-waist grooming, have an exclusive offer for our audience. Use code CTP, so like Crash the Pond, to get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. Join the other 2 million. Two million people is a lot. Two million men who trust Manscaped. They are here to make sure you are trimmed and smelling nice. After all, it's time for some spring cleaning. So, you know, Jake, spring is sprung and Manscaped has the best tools for us to get you to get myself ready. What have been some of the tools that you have uh, employed in your arsenal? So obviously, I mean, I've talked about this ad nauseum on the show. The weed, the weed whacker, though, the weed whacker. I'm a person that ha- has a little bit of nose hair, you know? It- it's a thing. It's there. It's annoying. My wife doesn't <laughs> love it. But Manscaped is there for you, just like they're there for me with the Weed Whacker. It has a uh, nose. It's for your nose and ear hair and provides proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps prevent nicks, snags, tugs in those delicate holes. No more gross nose hair flying in the wind which is a problem folks if you don't know uh and the weed whacker uses a 9000 rpm motor that's uh nope forgot what rpm means so you know just moving forward here 360 degree rotary blade or rotary dual blade system manscaped is making whacking your weeds a time to look forward uh to delivering maximum confidence while providing hygiene i mean what what have you found have you have you liked uh the the uh uh, the perfect package is uh, the entire package. What have you liked from it? Well, first off, they give us underwear, which, uh, yes, you know, I've got to say, especially today here in Southern California, it was really hot. And on a hot day, it's nice to it's nice to have comfort in, in those in those nether regions. Uh, but speaking of incredible hygiene, Manscaped has formulations to keep you fresh and ready for everything that comes your way all day. The Crop Preserver is an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer i don't know if you've used that jake i have and i'm no longer chafing and i no longer smell it's Uh, great moist ducks go chimes in in our twitch chat saying it's a rpms is rotations per minute so i need to yeah it's it's actually yeah i I, i'm a little surprised the engineer of the two here didn't Eh, know that eh. Um, i'm on the spot here you'll also find the crop reviver it's a spray on toner for your balls which will keep you smelling fresh down there just like spring flowers so speaking of smelling fresh Complete your grooming game this spring with the new refined cologne signature scent by Manscaped. This it, stuff is legit. It's very nice. And it'll have nice. you smell like royalty. It, yeah. It's, it's very, very nice. I've used it. It's nice. It smells good. The wife likes it, which at the end of the day is is why why I wear cologne. 
you know. <laughs> well, that you know, I think that that's a that's a good approach. So, everybody, make sure you smell good and feel good this spring. Spring is in the air. COVID vaccines are going to arms. The world is opening back up. So make sure you smell good when you start hanging out with people again. You know, it's it's National Hangout Day today for Christ's sake. So make sure you get that done. Um, get twenty percent off and free shipping with the code CTP. It's like crash the pond CTP at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code CTP at manscaped.com. It's spring cleaning and your balls will thank you. There you go, folks. Hopefully, uh, hopefully everybody got that uh, in one piece. Got through that in one piece. Yep. Yep. Good job, Felix. Good job. <laughs> okay. Good Lord. Let's uh, let's just, let's just move on here. Okay. Let's talk about the Vegas games and you know, do you how much do you how much stock do you put in the home versus away uh, narrative street that we'll often hear about that teams can play a different way in a certain building versus you know how they play at home things of that nature? I think it's definitely a little bit oversold. I, I think that there is something to there, and I think a lot of it has to do more so with travel than anything else, be because of the fact that the guys at home are going to be more so in their routines, they're going to be on their paths, whereas. Um, the, the, the road team is going to be potentially having traveled from different places, not in their comfort yeah. zone. And, and so I think that that does play a part into it, but I think that the narrative of if you're at home, you have a distinct advantage. I, I think it, it's a little bit overblown. Well, so the thing is with the Vegas golden Knights, and this is kind of where I'm going with this. And I, I do agree with you. It is partially overblown, but you can't totally overlook it either. Yep. There's always been this narrative that the ducks just play horribly in Vegas, that they just, you know, when they go to Vegas, they, they get ran over by that that Golden Knights team. And I think that's just been more so the fact that the Golden Knights are just better and have been better than the Ducks this entire time. And the thing is, I, I think my hypothesis is looking a little better because if you look at the game on Friday night where the Vegas Golden Knights were in Anaheim, uh, Vegas won this game and they outshot the Ducks 51, 51 to 16 in the process putting up four goals on the board. So this was about as bad, one of the worst games I've seen. I mean, like, you know, we talk a lot about head coach Dallas Akins and uh, the differences between him and Randy Carlisle. But you know what hasn't gone away with uh, with Dallas, Dallas Akins is the Ducks just absolutely getting steamrolled by the likes of the Vegas, Vegas Golden Knights and games like these where they just get brutally outshot. Yeah. So. Yep. Maybe it's because he's just as bad of a coach or maybe it's because the roster sucks. Who knows? But this was kind of one of those just burn the tapes types of games. There was just not a whole lot to write home about. So uh, just for funsies, I'm looking at Evolving <laughs> Hockey's game logs right now. Uh -huh. And all situations, expected goals against. Where do you think this game ranked in terms of uh, f all, uh, all situations, no adjustment, uh, expected goals against on the season? For the Ducks, yes. This, I'll I'll just say this was their worst game. Correct, four point seven one expected goals against. <laughs> um, funny enough, the four twelve game against the Sharks that Stolars had a shutout in was third, third worst. <laughs> so yeah, the Ducks just playing some awesome hockey right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So not a good game for the Ducks overall. Not a good game at all. I mean, the bummer was this was the first game, and, and we kind of buried this lead. Uh, the that fans were in the building. Yep. Yep. For, fans for the back Ducks and Center. just put in on an absolute stinker of a of a performance here. And granted, Vegas uh, overall a very very good team, no doubt. Like they are up there for one of the best teams in the league right now. A lot of different things, and so very good team. This was a bad performance by the Ducks, though. I believe uh, four point nine seven expected goals against. So I mean, for perspective, if anyone out there wanted to blame Gibson for allowing four goals an average goalie would have allowed five. And so that just really puts in perspective that even though Gibson maybe could have had a couple of them, he still was good in this game, even though he had allowed uh, four goals. Yeah, and, he, and, he, he was he was thrown to the wolves in this game. Yeah, no doubt. One, one question I have for you, actually, because I think this is a more entertaining topic than... Oh, I actually. just wanted to quickly point out uh, Hayden Flurry had a solid game at five on five. Correct. Just look at his numbers. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So, there you uh, go. Hayden Flurry once again having a good game of breaking the puck out. The only duck above fifty percent expected goals for per, uh, percentage. Um, but there's a narrative that was being pushed a little bit in the game today, 
and I wanted to get your opinion on this because I think this I is, listen with the commentary off. So I, could, I think I think this is a, I think this is a more fun conversation than actually discussing this game because this game was god awful and there's not a whole lot of good things to talk about from it. But nope. um, the uh, broadcast crew was essentially saying that. Uh, it's going to be interesting to look at Seattle because the expectations are going to be so high on them and the expansion draft rules are in their favor. But the the fact that um, you have the way that Vegas did, like the, the pressure is going to be on. Like, are, like I, I think you and I definitely agree on this. And so one thing I just want to put out there, the expansion draft rules weren't in Vegas's favor. Like what it was and i think that that's something that's really important to put out there is that yes they they did adjust the rules last expansion draft um to help vegas be better sooner than the way that it used to be no doubt but it's not as if the the rules are are set in a way to make sure well, vegas was a juggernaut well i think that the 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 the, the issue with that argument is that it completely overlooks the other side of it which is that the, the teams didn't do the best job of preparing. I mean, kind of shocking that the broadcast crew for the Anaheim Ducks, the team that maybe screwed up the expansion draft the most, is the one pushing this narrative that uh, the league was uh, was essentially stacking yeah. the deck. I mean, look, it's. But, I think there is a case. There there is a case that the rules were like you just said were more friendly to the Knights, but you can't you can't just say that part of it. There's I, another part of it. I think what that misses is the fact that Vegas. I I think that if you looked at the Vegas team when they first their very first season, right? That team, if you look at the roster, that team should not have been good. And, no. And, and so it, it's not really a situation where this was set up to make Vegas good. That roster was not good. Like that roster was about on par with the Ducks right now. Like I remember, the, I remember before that season predicting they wouldn't not make the playoffs. But so. but like look at the way the Ducks roster is. It's a bunch of like second second and third liners. That's essentially what Vegas was. And the thing was they got lucky. And the thing that makes Vegas so good now is that they've turned what was unsustainable into something sustainable by making yeah. good, good moves to improve the roster, improve the team. And they have made no bones about the fact that they don't feel loyalty to their players and they are <laughs> like for better and worse. Like they don't feel loyalty to their, to their players and they're willing to move them out yeah. and, just, and, and bring just guys ask in. Mark Andre Fleury and his agent. Yeah. <laughs> and, and ask uh, Nate Schmidt. Like, well, so, so I, I think that is a good point though. I think that's actually a really good point because if you're basing all of this, if you're if you're basing your conclusion off of about Vegas and it being stacked in their favor on their first season, then you're probably kind of misunderstanding what they actually did that year. It's yep. what they've done since yep. that's more impressive. Yep. So exactly. that is a good point. Exactly. But Jake is also like a a, a low key Vegas. Well, I think you're kind of a fan of the team. You won't. You'll never admit what? it, but you. You appreciate their approach. I know. Yes, yes. I appreciate their approach because they they've done a good job of not giving two shits about things and just going for it and doing what's necessary <laughs> yeah. to make a good team. Not caring yeah. about the the make loyal a good product. Not not caring about the the loyalty to a player or anything like that. Which maybe sounds cold. Maybe maybe sounds all these different things. But at the end of the day, this business is about winning and putting out a good product and. Vegas understands that Vegas goes for it. Vegas goes out and signs guys and they figure out ways to make it work with the now cap. in in four years, you know, it's going to look a lot different, but I mean, with, this, this is their contract. This is their yeah. contending window. And so they're going mm -hmm. for it and, and they're yep. going out and signing these guys and doing it. And so, I mean, I, I think kind of turning this into a conversation about what to expect for Seattle, Seattle's not going to be good their first year. Most likely like the, yeah. sure it's possible. It's the NHL where, where they come out, they, they have a Vegas 2.0. But more likely than not, Seattle's going to be a bottom tier, bottom tier team in the league. Like, well, here, here, they're here, here, they're here, here. basically going to like they're going to be the Ducks. Like, at the end of the day, do you think the Seattle, do you think the Vegas roster that very first year was better than the Ducks are now? If you were to look at that roster going into it and compare it to the Ducks roster going in, knowing what we knew at the time. Well, here's the thing. I think they'll probably do about how Vegas did, just in terms of the peripherals and the underlying numbers. They they're probably just not going to get the yeah. the results. Yeah. They're probably just not going to go on these shooting percentage and PDO benders. Um, yeah. Like I I think they could you know Seattle could probably cobble together a a, a roster that'll compete, but I would be very like I would I would I would bet against them who going anywhere that first year. Who do you think is going to be better next year, the Ducks or or, or Seattle? I think Seattle can definitely be better. Ooh, uh, that's the th I disagree that's the th there. <laughs> okay, well I mean. Look how look how the Ducks are this year. 
you're telling me that that's going to change next year or that's going to change I think in a that, significant way next year? I the think Ducks that, have the worst expected goals for percentage in the league. They're below 45%. Wait, when did that happen? I missed that. I haven't been checking uh, Evolving Hockey just because it's depressing. The Ducks are extremely bad. Did the and Ducks drop below uh, drop below uh, LA and Winnipeg? They were 31st as of this afternoon. Maybe that's changed after tonight's games. Let but me, let me let me double check here. No, uh, let let let's see. I'm just curious here. Uh, <laughs> no, the Ducks are no. You've got the Blue Jackets, the Kings, then the Sabers, then the Ducks. This is per evolving hockey, though. Yeah. See, I'm looking at natural stat. Trick. There we go. That's the they're thir- they're 31st. So, regardless, they're a bottom bottom of the bottom tier team. So. If the bet is can Seattle be better than that, I will. I have no problem saying that they can do that. Like, come on, I'll take and, the, and don't, I'll take the don't give, over them. And don't give me the whole oh well, John Gibson could get hot. No, that, or, that that's not my narrative. My narr- my narrative is that the entire Seattle roster is basically going to be a similar thing to the Ducks. Like, if, if the players that they're getting are third liners primarily. That's going to be the majority of their roster. Their roster composition is going to be worse than the Ducks. Okay, well, if you're asking me, will they? That I would need more time to think about. But can they? Yes, absolutely. Can they? Sure, but will they? That, that's like my the, point. The bar is very, very low. Yep. Very, very low. And you got to think about, we're going back. To, we're, we're changing the divisions next year. We're going back to how it was pr- previously. And I think that that may actually, that could hurt or help either of the teams we're talking about here. Yep. So, so let, let's jump into the, the five, two game. Then there, there is a topic I want to discuss. It just, I can't believe you would, you have that much confidence in the ducks, even, for, even I, against a team that doesn't exist. I, I just, I legitimately think that people overblow how much the expansion draft is set up to favor Seattle. Oh, well, I, I don't agree with that. Like, I don't think that, no, it, I that it favors them, but I just think that this is more so for me, a commentary on how bad the ducks have been. That's fair. And, like the, the coaching staff is going to be the same. The roster is probably mean, going to be very similar up in the air on there. Who knows? Well, okay. I think the assistant coaching, the assistant coaches are gone or at least Mark Morrison's gone, but I don't know if Dallas Aikens is gone. Uh, you seem to believe otherwise. Okay. Let's talk about today's game. Let's, let's just let's get back on track. Get back on track. Hey, that was a good conversation. I'm happy with that one. <laughs> well, so the ducks put up a more respectable performance today. The Sunday afternoon game, 1 PM at Honda center, Fans in the building, no Angels game across the street because of the Twins being irresponsible, and so uh, the the all the eyes of Southern California were on this game, and uh, you know the Ducks outshot the Vegas Golden Knights thirty five to twenty nine, lost it five to two, empty net goal at the very end. Some you know some encouraging moments. I mean, <laughs> there was like a four on one goal yeah. with Max Goldtwa tucking it away. Uh, kind of a weird one. And Danton Heinen scoring a nice goal. Danton Heinen, who, by the way, is just now a fixture on a line next to Adam Henrique and Jakob Silverberg. Yep. It's funny how all the players who Dallas Aikens referred to play in the beginning of the year are the ones that are now playing well. Funny how that works. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. Shocker. Maybe, maybe the people that were clamoring for it and being pushed back on for clamoring for it were actually right. Who knows? Yeah. Um, what did you think of this game, though? I thought the Ducks played a better game to start. I mean, this was, I think there were signs of uh, to be encouraging or signs of encouragement in this game for the Ducks on the whole. I mean, they played a much better game per evolving hockey uh, in all situations. uh, 3.04 goals for expected goals for for Vegas, Uh, 2.45 for the Ducks. And so all situations, including power plays, I like to look at that for a good flow of the game. And so the Ducks did a good job in this game overall. Three go- expected goals for, uh, against is a lot better than where they were at at 4.97. So they did a good job. I, I think the the one criticism of this game is I said last game that John Gibson de- deserves credit even in the loss. Um, Uh-oh. In this game, he was below expected. I mean, he allowed four goals when uh, basically he should have allowed only three. And so you oh, can – 29 shots is just you know and and at one point in time he had allowed three goals on seven shots and so it's a situation where sure though those shots are high quality vegas uh, although vegas lost the the shot quantity battle they won the quality battle in all situations and so this is a, a a scenario where even though vegas wasn't getting a lot of looks the looks that they got were high quality looks and that is a a a uh an issue if you're a ducks fan because um, uh-huh. you, you would like to see those shots kept to the outside. If you're doing a good job of limiting them, you want to keep those limited and keep them in non-dangerous situations. And so that really speaks to the fact that the shots, when they came were in those high danger situations, you think, yeah, but Mark's- see, I actually, I actually somewhat disagree with that. Like okay. 
the two of the goals, yes. I mean, you can definitely say that due to the quality. Well, I'm just I'm just the, saying overall shot quality. It, like yes, when you but, when you're looking but, at three three and seven, but still three and seven is not good enough, even even with a high shot quality. Yeah, and look, if we're looking at the goals that went in, maybe this isn't the correct way to evaluate because you also need to look at the ones he did stop. But if you look at the goals he let in, I mean, you know, the first goal on Pacioretty, it's a tip. Those are really hard to stop for goalies, uh, even really good goalies. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to give him too much flack for that one. But the second goal from Alex Petrangelo, I mean, he's at the top of the circles. He's unchallenged. He's a right-handed shot who is on the left side of the ice. So he's got a ton of angle, but he's, pretty far away right like and and John Gibson is a very clear line of sight there's nobody screening him and Petrangelo gets his shot shot off and it just it just beats Gibson clean and those are the ones where you know you want to see a save I think if you're John Gibson if you're if your goalie coach Sadarshan Maharaj you just want to see him come up with the save there and you know what was wrong with it I mean to me it looks as though he didn't really track the puck that well because when he goes down when he initially goes down in his butterfly, there's there's no head movement. He's not actually tracking the puck. He's just kind of going down instinctively. And so that one was concerning. Uh, but to me, the most egregious one was the one against Nick Waugh, where, I mean, he just, you know, he gets beat short side. Uh, again, no traffic in front. So, you know, sometimes I think with Gibson, his, his tracking ability, that puck tracking, which is so important for goalies, maybe a little off on those clean shots. I don't know. Yeah. And what do you think about it? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's fair. And I think at the end of the day, like you can get by with a goalie allowing a goal like that. But the issue is allowing two of them is, I mean, that was the difference legitimately allowing both those goals as compared to just one of them was the difference between being a league average goalie and being below average in this game or below expected in this game. Yeah. Like, and look, there, there's, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to say you're being hard on Gibson. What's he supposed to do? He's behind this crummy defense. He's playing with, with one night of rest. And look, all those things, no, neither of us are ignoring those things. Like those are true, but look, John Gibson has this reputation as an elite goalie as one of the best goalies in the NHL. And so I think we would not be doing our jobs here if we didn't hold him to a very high standard. Um, if he was like a journeyman goalie who has not put up results in the past, then maybe we would be taking a different tone, but just objectively, these are not good goals to let in, even if he wasn't. Uh, a previous, you know, high caliber goalie. I mean, here's the thing. 18 of his uh, games this season, I'm just kind of looking. Uh, sorry, 17 of these games, he's been below expected. 17 of his uh, of his 29, I believe is how many he's played in. And I mean, some of the, one of those is negative 0.01. And the thing is, uh, he does have one to make it 18, or sorry. Well, look. 16 or uh, 16 you, of his you, games. You brought it up. You brought it up. I don't think John Gibson's been good this season, and I don't think he's been good in a couple years. And maybe it's just this team being bad. Maybe it's the environment being bad. Maybe there's something in the numbers that we have that just don't really kind of fully explain what's going on. Yep. But it, I think it directly correlates to Aikens coming in. Yes, but at the end of the day, he was extremely good under Randy Carlisle, yep. who, you know, I don't think was coaching up a great defensive nope. system there either. So. I don't know what's gone wrong in his game. And this is something that, you know, we'll, we'll need to do some diving into, but it's, um, it's a little bit of a concern. And maybe once this team is competitive again, maybe when they have a more set in stone or, a, a, you know, a better roster, maybe then his performance will pick back up. But it is a bit concerning that he's just been so far below what we've come to expect from him. DB Lowry asked a good question. What explains the difference between Gibson's play in the first month of the season and now? So my initial thought there was rest. But I'm kind of, after looking at some of the data and numbers behind Gibson and the amount of rest uh -huh. he's had, I've kind of backed off that opinion because it's not as if he's a guy that's been good when he's had a couple days off between games. But, I mean, I, I still think that there is an overall wear and tear on him that has come from playing so many games back to back to back. And so I, I think that, I mean, maybe these two games are a clear example of that where game one of the this two-game set, he was really good, played on top of his game. The, the Ducks were allowing insane chances against, and he was doing a good job of staying up for it, whereas in, in this game, he wasn't necessarily as, on top of his game uh, as he was previously. And so um, I, I think maybe there is something to the rest angle. Obviously, I just don't know if we have the sample size to really determine that information with the fact of, um, 
the that it's a new system with Akins and everything along those lines. So one other thing that is kind of discouraging is Jamie Drysdale's play of late. And so this is something I wanted to get into. So uh, Dallas Akins has really forced his hand or forced the fact that he wants to right. He wants the, the Drysdale Manson pairing to happen. He wants two right-handed shots on the same pairing and is specifically putting Jamie Drysdale on his offside as, as a result and did it so much where in today's game, he actually had uh, two lefties together with Larson and Fowler together and then dry, two righties together with Drysdale and Manson. And so it's something I want to briefly talk about because I, I really tried to focus on Drysdale in today's game to, to really see because the numbers are not good on him if you look at rpm if you look at expected goals for if you look at a whole lot of different things they're not great the the main issue that we have here is and i think this is the big qualifier with all of this is that um i think he's played 170 minutes at five on five with josh manson which means 170 minutes um of his uh, uh uh or of his on ice time has been spent on his offside whereas he's only i think spent about 70 minutes without manson so only 70 minutes on his right side and what I noticed in today's game specifically was, and not extrapolating out because I haven't gone back and watched all of his shifts from every game and really that fine-tuned uh, detail, um, but there were a couple of shifts where he specifically got the puck, pulled the puck out of the corner, got it on onto stick um, in some way from the left-hand side and was going up and basically had to clear the puck out, get it past uh, uh, someone coming in on a forecheck on him, jumping down, pinching down, whatever it is, and, and he's on his backhand. And he flips it up the board and because he's on his backhand, he's a guy that or, or the puck ends up turning over and there's an extended zone time as a result of it. And, and so the zone exit is specifically impacted by the fact that he's on his left side because he has to be on his backhand. Whereas if he's on the right side there and the same exact situation happens, just mirrored, he's on his forehand there and can make a little bit of a different play, pick out a better play, have instead of when you're on your backhand, your your chest is kind of closed off. You can't see as much because of where your your body has to be to have the puck on your backhand. Whereas when you're on your forehand and you have the puck there, your chest is a little bit more open. Your eyes can see a bit more to be able to make a play there. And so I think he's able to, in a zone exit on his right side, be able to pick out a better play than just chipping it up the boards. And I think that's a big reason why his numbers have been so poor lately is that he's playing on his offside. And regardless of if he's a guy that has gone to to co the coaching staff and said, I'm comfortable on my left side, or he has the athleticism for it, whatever argument you want to give for it being a good thing, it's not working. And so with it not working, you need to make a change because I think it's 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 hurting him overall. And it's at the end of the day, this season is about his development and his numbers aren't good. He's getting stuck on the ice for a lot of chances against, a lot of expected goals against, a lot of shot against, and getting caved in. And I, I don't know if it's necessarily his partnership with Manson that's a result, but at the end of the day, the numbers that we have are not are not glowing. And it's time to put him back on his side, allow him to develop. I mean, it's not that hard of, of a thing to say. Let him develop in the position that you see him playing long term. Well, that's the thing. I think that that's the crux of the argument here is that what do the Ducks actually want out of the Jamie Drysdale experience? It does If they see him long term as a, as a guy on the left side or a guy who can play both, then sure. But is this really where you see him? Because, you know, you'll hear arguments like, well, this is what the coaching staff thinks can work. Just give it time. Maybe Drysdale is comfortable with it. You know, Drysdale's a teenager. He's just going to nod along to whatever to they tell him. Whatever they yeah, like, he's going to say whatever exactly. you want to get, to get ice time. So that doesn't hold any weight for me. Um, and yeah, like the, the numbers have been really, really bad. And I am just curious. And I feel like, at one point, they maybe had a couple of good games and Dallas Higgins got it into his head that this is going to work. And ever since then, it's blown up spectacularly. And what's what's interesting is that on Friday, he did switch up the pairings for a little he bit. He, he put Drysdale with Fowler and I thought, OK, you know, an admission that this is that something needs to be changed there. And instead, went back to the same pairings. Granted, today, the Ducks were a lot better defensively. So I think that we should at least make note of that. But long term, I I do agree that it's just a a problematic setup if you do see him as a as a guy who's supposed to be on the right side. And also, look, Drysdale is a, is a rookie. He's playing on his offside. He's playing on a bad defensive team. It's going to be hard for him to to put up really good on ice stats unless he's this like prodigy, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's just it's a little frustrating. It's getting to the point now where it just feels like they should switch it up. Um, 
Well, it, it's, I, it, I, I feel like that that pairing is kind of proving that it doesn't work. It, it's at the end of the day, it comes down to putting guys into positions to succeed as compared to positions to fail. And mm-hmm. and basically, sure, Drysdale may have good games here and there, but at, at the end of the day, you're not putting him in his natural position. And as an 18 year old, you should be or 19, I think now you should be putting him in the best spot that he can to succeed yeah. and, in his and, game I will and say, develop his game. I agree with that. And and out of fairness, they you know Manson and Drysdale did post some some decent numbers today from an expected goals per- perspective, 59.9. I think a lot of that is being driven by that four on run one rush, which happens. Okay. That, that's well, part look, of it. I mean, we don't it. want that's part of it. That's part. Of yeah, it. exactly. Like if we're talking about a small sample, yep. we can't toss out. I agree. Small I, sample I agree. Numbers. Just adding, adding that context. I know, but you, you have this tendency. You have this tendency. So <laughs> calling me out. Wow. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I just said you have a tendency. Um, but yeah, so I think with Drysdale, I would just prefer to see him on his, on his, uh, Right and his strong side, I think that that's where he'll be long term. I don't think he really benefits in this scenario. Um, you know, and if if you want to say, well, it's good for him to go through adversity, it's like, well, he can go through adversity in his natural side where he'll eventually be long term. So, you know, it's funny that the Ducks were so afraid of of rushing him and uh, and pulling a Cam Fowler and and messing up his development. It's like, well, you're kind of you're kind of playing with fire here a little bit, even though you were saying how how much you were conscious of that and how afraid you were of repeating that they're they're kind of they're kind of towing that fine line right now yep um and so anything else you want to add uh well on this game no not particularly i mean like i said it was a more solid game from the ducks overall um i thought that up front sam Steele, you know he's been in the lineup and he's looked okay um still not seeing a whole lot there just getting in my my Sam Steele mentioned there. I think that Dance and Heinen has looked quite solid, which so, you know hold, we, we, hold we that. touched on. Hold that. We got we got two questions from DMs, and one of them covers that a bit. So oh, okay, well, perfect. Um, but yeah, outside of that, just wanted to mention that Trevor Zegers is going bananas in the AHL. Yep, just putting up a ton of points. Yep, and, and, uh, and that's do, always exciting. Doing it both on the power play and at five on five. We should yep. we should mention if you haven't watched his goal that he scored, I think was it Thursday night when he scored it, the breakaway goal in Ontario, yep. uh-huh. where he he goes forehand, backhand, turns the stick over so it's towed down on the ice, and then kind of almost like a cue ball shot, just flicks it in. Yeah, like basically chips it up and over the pad. Like, yep, it, it's one of those where based because of the camera angle, it's really hard to fully appreciate because the camera angles at center. It's the ice. HL. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, but when you see that goal and you can finally appreciate it, that's a, like the creativity that it takes to pull off that move and to even think about doing that. Like, I well, don't know if I, I don't know if I've ever seen a player do that. Well, I've seen people do that on Instagram. You know, I've seen, I've seen like skills coaches posting their little highlight videos doing that, but I've yeah. never seen someone try that in a game. So for him to try it, like you said, and it wasn't a shootout the... either. It was in, on a breakaway. Yeah. He is an extremely confident a uh, young man, <laughs> Trevor Zegers, like he, he does not give a, a, a damn if it doesn't work or not. He just goes for it. And uh, you got to respect that. And I think, you know, I know that maybe some people will scoff at this whole thing, you know, that it's maybe a little hot dogging to try these moves, but uh, that's part of development. You're in a lower league. He knows that he's very good in this league. So why not try stuff? See if it works. Um, that's where this game is going. Anyway, guys being more creative. So, once he develops that confidence even further and it translates to the NHL, I think that fans are going to be in for a treat. I mean, we've already seen him try the Michigan yeah. in, in, in like his third Ducks game or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, he's a fun player. And, and I mean, you saw it with his celebration that basically pits, uh when he hit the empty net that pissed off all of the Ontario rain bench. And mm-hmm. I love it. I mean, the game, this is about entertainment. That is entertaining. Well, especially for you as a pro wrestling fan. I yeah. feel like that's that's right oh, up your alley. 100%. Like it, well, it, well, also, I mean, I think part of the reason that the Ducks are having such a hard time with Zegris and developing him, because look, this has been kind of a weird uh, a weird path that, that they've taken with his development this season. I think part of it is that, that he is a new age player. He's very confident. You might even say he's cocky. Oh, 100% and, uh, he's cocky. And Bob Murray, you know, he's not he, a... Not that kind of guy. The Ducks not, have not... been built in the image of Ryan Getzloff for years, who's a guy that comes out and, and basically goes against guys hot dogging it a bit and yeah. does, doesn't like that type of game, has his old and school. Dallas Aikens is the same way. 
Um, and, and what's funny is that if you watch the video of the draft, uh, the Zegras draft, the first thing that Bob Murray tells him, and one of the first thing he tells him to Zegras is now the work begins. Now the work begins. Like that's the, that's like one of the first things he says to Zegras after being drafted. And it's like, you know, you can just tell that they're very, mm, you know, like we want, we, we want you, we think you're great, but uh, it's just, why do you have to be so cocky? So I I'm here for it. I think that the more the more that Zegers can be cocky, the more oh, that he great. can be. It's better for the game. It's better Matthews, for the game. Matthews Patrick Kane esque. Uh, yeah. The better. Yeah, exactly. Um, so let's just hit these. We, I got these questions from DM, so I want to hit them really quick, and then we'll get into mm-hmm. the Twitch uh, Twitch chat, and we'll kind of round this thing out with some questions from there. So this one, uh, I believe it came from uh, Steve Hawking. Said if you had a uh, had to draft a team to play one game tomorrow. And you could take one forward off the Ducks, excluding Getzloff. Who would you take? <sighs> oh, wow. So, okay. So this is for one a team. One game tomorrow, and you could pick one player from the Ducks for that team. And it had to be f- uh, one forward, and it could it not be, be Getzloff. Uh, I think the, the logical answer is Ricard Raquel. Yeah. Ricard, I, I, was I think very, Ricard Raquel or Adam Henrique, honestly. I was going to say Troy Terry just, just to keep the – keep the bit going but i think it's got to be ricard raquel i think ricard raquel has the most lethal shot and- in a in a one game scenario i think raquel is the guy you want with yeah. that shot yep i i would put adam Henrique maybe in there also i think he's kind of up yeah. there for for those types of guys um but yeah I, I think that that's the right call and then we had a question from uh sean seabolt who said uh has heinen been good since becoming a fixture in the lineup just curious to hear you two break down his stats so there, there's your Danton Heinen uh, question for you. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, just from an eye test perspective, he's been doing what he kind of always does. He's he's solid in his own zone. He breaks up plays. He gets passes going up ice. Now, as far as his numbers go, this is a more interesting question because I actually haven't spend, spent a ton of time looking at those. And they've just on the season, you know, they've been okay. He hasn't been this kind of high impact guy. I'm, I mean, I'm looking at expected goals on, uh, on natural stat trick and his, his differentials there aren't necessarily awesome, but he's also been close to break even on a team with a lot of guys who are well below. Yeah. That and, and so I'm going through the game log right now on evolving hockey in terms of expected goals for percentage on the whole, um, throughout the season and kind of looking back to about kind of mid March. Cause I think that's when he really started to, to get a foothold and be in the lineup a bit more. He had a couple really good performances, 50, uh, all above 50% expected goals for percentage. And ever since then, it's kind of been a lot of up and down a lot of uh, some 15%, some 60%, uh, kind of, I mean, that's kind of what happens in a league. You, you have your good games, you have your bad games. And, and so I think on the whole, that that's kind of, uh, come out when you look at kind of his well, RAPM charts. Which... So his his last in the in the Ducks last ten games, he has a thirty three percent expected goals percentage. So. Yeah, and, and so I, I'm looking. <laughs> that is I, bad. Just yeah. for everybody right now on the screen. There. Right now on the screen is uh is his uh RAPM chart per evolving hockey, and you can see it, it's it's kind of middle of the road. I mean, goals four per six, he's down. Uh, Corsi against per six he's is, down. That's who he is. Like yeah. he is not in some elite player. He's he's an okay, you know, kind of replacement, maybe slightly above replacement level player. Yep. Which which is kind of what we said. And the thing was for the Ducks for the longest time when they were scratching him, that would be an improvement for this roster because they were icing a lot of guys that were below replacement level for a long time. And so mm-hmm. at, at the end of the day, Danton Heinen getting ice time, it's not necessarily the fact that he's this great player that this a revolutionary type player, but he's a good player, a good hockey player replacement level that can do well for your team and is better than a lot of what they were icing. Yeah. And also situationally, he adds some value like on the penalty kill on the rush, different things like that. Um, Yeah. Actually in in the ducks last 10 games, this is just kind of fun here. Um, (laughs) The guy who has the highest expected goals percentage is Hayden Fleury at 70, yeah, he's, 71%. He's been very good in his couple of games for the Ducks. And I think part of that, I, I said this when you and I briefly talked before the show, Kevin Shattenkirk. I mean, Kevin Shattenkirk has been saddled with some poor partners uh, for a lot of the season ever since Lindholm's gone down. And, I mean, Shattenkirk's been a guy that, that has been solid for, for the Ducks mm-hmm. in terms of generating offense. And I think that in some ways the meshing of him and Flurry has been really good for both the players because Hayden Flurry is just not – he, he, as we said, he's not a guy that's going to drive your offense. Shattenkirk does. 
Shattenkirk's a guy yeah. that completely drives your offense. They are they are complementary type skill sets, yep. I would say, those two. Yep. Um, also, second highest, it's just two games in terms of expected goals percentage, but Trevor Zegras. Just thought I'd put that out there. <laughs> yep. So um, so let, let's get into some questions from the Twitch chat. So for those of you watching on YouTube, yes, we're on YouTube. You can find us at youtube.com slash crash the pond if you want to like and subscribe there. That helps out immensely. Um, or your favorite podcast services. We do our real, uh, our the real fun thing is our live stream, twitch.tv slash crash the pond. Every Sunday, 8 p.m., we are back on the Sunday grind. Uh, after two weeks of Monday pods, we will, we are now back on Sunday episodes. So, uh, for those of you, uh, that want to help support the show, you can do it in a way completely free to you. If you have Amazon prime, you get one free Twitch prime sub each and every month. You do have to hit that subscribe button after 30 days. You also don't necessarily need Amazon prime. You can just do it through the regular, uh, Twitch or Twitch, uh, subbing, uh, process and uh, you can be just like Ken Pafu who resubbed for 21 months, Lewis X209 who resubbed for 31 months, that guy Bobski resubbed for five months, and then our good friend Jess from our beer league team, uh, Science Cat 108 gifted out, I believe it was five subs to B1 wow. Somd 48, DB Lowry 3507, M Rero 91, Anime Holics D 94, and Zenas 8. And then Jess also resubbed for seven months and Bionic Chris resubbed for 12 months. So thank you to all of you. Um, so if you have questions, by the way, start throwing them into the Twitch, ch- Twitch chat. Uh, <laughs> why are you giving me that look? Uh, <laughs> and just add question at the front of it just to help me find it. So we have a couple. Let's start with this. Odog81 says, do you guys think that Dallas Aikens uh, line combinations could be uh, improved? If so, then how? What do you think could would maximize the Ducks' chance of scoring goals? So I, I have the Ducks lineup up from today. Let's just go off of that. Okay. So so line one, and of course we know that these aren't necessarily one through four, but this is how the order in which they're listed. Heinen, Henrik, Silverberg. Uh, I think I'm fine leaving that alone. Are, are you in agreement there? Uh, not really, honestly. Um, okay. The, the, I mean, it's a it's a fine. It's one of his better lines that he's put together it's one of his better lines but i think it it misutilizes adam henrique a little bit because adam henrique's a guy who on his career has been an above average shooter Mm -hmm. and part of that is is him being given the puck in situations to shoot and that's not necessarily heinen or silverberg's game and so i think heinen and silverberg on the whole are good together but i don't necessarily think they should be with adam henrique i think adam henrique should be with a guy like a troy terry that is creative and here's a puck here's a fun one for you uh, I would actually take Henrik off of center and put him on the wing with Getzlaff and Terry because we've seen that line yeah. be really good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that there's a lot of complementary skill sets going on there as well. Um, so, yeah, I think Henrik off of line one. Who do you put in that center spot, though, is the question. Uh, that is a good question. Um, I mean, why not just throw David Backus in there? Yeah, David Backus Old would be a great friend pick, of the show. A, a great pick for there. And then I think so. And then, of course, now we're already juggling. But Jones gets off Terry. I mean, I think that that line is mostly fine. You know, it's you're getting the kids uh, and you're getting Troy Terry with Ryan gets Max Coltois steel Raquel. Now, this is a line that I think. Uh, look, Max Coltois, no doubt, had a breakout year in terms of production, but his defensive game is still. And I, I hate to keep harping on this because I feel like it's it's I don't want to take away from the production he's had, but. He's still not a guy who, when he's out there, the Ducks are suppressing shot attempts or chances against. And so you would want to see him with a center who's a bit better defensively than Steele. And even Raquel's not a great defensive player either. So I don't know. I don't really know what you do there necessarily. I mean, once Lundestrom is healthy enough again, I think you get him back in that spot where where Steele is or you replace him for Grant. Another guy I'd like to see at, at the center position there is, is Trevor Zegras. Just have Zegras between Coltois and Raquel and just see where it goes. Yep. I think that would be an awesome line. And yep. I think it'd be a lot of fun to watch. Yep. I completely agree there. And um, the obvious one, just to kind of finish up on this topic, just with the defense pairs, uh, just just get Manson, just get Drysdale on the right side. Get Fowler, Drysdale. You can go Larson, Manson if you want. I wouldn't do that. And then do Flory, Shattenkirk. Yep. There you go. Or, or you know, Cody Coran, Josh Manson. Yeah. Yeah. Give Curran a, give Curran a shot. He, he has yet had a shot this season and it it's still kind or, of i mean i think confusing i think drysdale flurry could also work and you could go fowler shattenkirk i mean there are a lot of options there that just put guys in in positions to succeed 
at the end. I of the would day. really want to see Fowler at uh, Drysdale. Just so they for, were briefly for the used value. together on what was that Friday's game? And Friday. I think they they their first shift together got scored on, and so that was a, a bad start for them in uh, Dallas Aikens' mind. So uh, Ducks Go said, "Do you see Getzloff retiring this off season because he doesn't want to go through a rebuild? And who do you no. think the duck and?" Do you think, and if you do, who do you think the Ducks spend their money on in this UFA class? And he had mentioned. I don't, I don't think he retires because if you listen to what he said, at least publicly this season, it sounds like he's on board with the rebuild. He's on board with uh, the plan that Bob Murray has in place. And Ryan Getzlaff has been good this season. I mean, Jake, you should put up his RAPM charts on the screen here. On like, it. you know, he, he hasn't been amazing, right? You know, the production has not been there. But in terms of his impact on the game, he's on still now. he's still above replacement level in terms of offense. He's he's been good defensively, suppressing shot attempts against. He's actually been one of the Ducks' better players in the power play. So, and that's at 35 years old. Uh, and so, I still think he's got something to give this team. And if he can hang around just long enough to where they can start to improve around him, he could still be a, a contributor for a team that's trying to push for the playoffs. Yeah. So. Yep, I agree. There is my there is my Getzlaff is still good take. You know, it's like we we did the whole Perry is still good. I think we need to get on the Getzlaff is still good I mean, uh, bandwagon. The, the issue there is that I don't think there's as many people uh, rallying against Ryan Getzlaff as there were. Well, yeah, because Corey, Corey Perry. Corey Perry has that. Uh, what is it about him? What what has he possibly done to get people to dislike him or? <laughs> Wishes for his demise. Who knows? And in terms of UFAs for the Ducks to go after, I mean, I don't really think that they should. I mean, Ovechkin, I don't think is going to go anywhere. I think he stays in uh, in Washington, and I would not see him coming to the Ducks. Weird way to spell uh, Moscow, but uh, okay. But, I mean, at the end of the day, guys that are UFAs are going to demand uh, the top dollar. Guys like Gabriel Landeskog, who's a UFA this summer, and I mean, that's, I mean, you're giving out contracts to guys that basically are not going to age well. So I, I'd go against it. You also have the fact that uh, the Ducks cap is not as uh, bright and shiny as everyone thinks it is. They're going to have to spend money and resign guys. So there's not going to be a whole lot of cap space necessarily next year. Um, they, Which they, is what you want as a rebuilding team. They you want to you they, have lower I mean, flexibility. They could dip into LTIR if they want, but I doubt that they do. So I, I don't think the Ducks end up doing anything of note on the UFA market this upcoming uh, summer. Um, so let's get into the next question. Uh, this comes from M. Young said, with the Ducks RFA situation having six, i.e. Heinen, Jones, Lundestrom, Comtois, Steele, and Volkov, do you think the Ducks uh, will struggle to sign them all to a contract? Who wouldn't you guys offer a contract to, if any, and who gets the biggest contract in your opinion? So do you think the Ducks don't qualify any of those? So just so I am making sure I'm understanding, if you qualify someone, that means that they then have to get at least what they were getting before uh, in terms of the previous contract. Let me double check. I believe if you're making over $1 million, uh, that uh, basically, yes, you have to make at least what you were getting before. I think if you're under a million, there's a percentage raise on that. Let me let me look. Well, that up. it's it's because like last summer we saw guys like you know Kiefer sure would not get qualified, and then they so, ended up making less than he, what they had been. Here on you before. go. You get 110 percent of the base salary from the prior year if the base salary is less than or equal to 660k. 105% of the base salary if it, the base salary is greater than 660k or uh, but less than 1 million and the qualifying offer cannot exceed 1 million and then basically 100% of the base salary if the base salary is equal to 100 or uh, base salary is equal to uh, greater than 1 million equal to or greater. So I could see some guys not getting qualified just because of the weird economic realities right now and potentially you see some weird deals that get signed that are cheaper than they should be. But I mean, I think all those guys that M. Young listed are coming back. Um, I mean, personally, I'm very low on some of these players, like Steele, for example, Lindstrom. I don't want to say I'm very low on him, but I go back and forth on him. Overall, though, I think it makes sense to bring them back. None of them are going to break the bank. Maybe Contois' negotiation will get a little, uh, you know, will get a little interesting. But overall, they're all probably going to be pretty I think, cheap. I think and- Steels can get interesting. Also, Steel has the games played. Yeah, he does, but like there's a ceiling there. Yeah. 
I, I think Steele probably gets the Troy Terry contract because of the games played and the points that he's put up in those games. No comment. Okay. Um, no comment. And um, I, the only person I think might not get qualified there is going to be Danton Heinen. And that's, I think, partially due to him making the most out of that group. Yeah. Um, and so he basically, if the Ducks qualify him, that qualifying offer has to be $2.8 million. And so yeah. I don't know. The Ducks may view it as they don't want to give that much to a player that has not been fully in the lineup that the coaching staff may have issues with who knows what it is. And so it may be a situation where they just don't qualify Danton Heinen and he becomes a UFA. It's certainly possible. Um, or they don't qualify him and then just sign him to a cheaper deal. Yeah. Biggest contract so. I think is definitely Comtois though. Yeah. That his number is going to be interesting because yeah. he's got 13 goals and pro rated. I mean, he, he'd be, he'd be above 20 in a normal season and those guys tend to get some money. So it'll be interesting for sure. Um, well, here, here's the thing. How comfortable would you feel giving Contois like a significant extension or, or contract? I think bridge, all, all, bridge, bridge. Well, it's going to be a bridge. He's not, or let me ask, let me put it to you a different way. Like what is, what is a number that makes you uncomfortable for Contois? Four. Four. Okay. So anything below four. Yeah. Even if it was like three point five, you would be okay with that. Three point five. I, I, I'm a little uncomfortable, but I, I, it's not horrible. Okay. Okay. Just, just making sure. I mean, just, the the other the in. other thing is we have yet to really see where the market has settled at on players with it being a flat cap world. True. So True. where where contra- maybe that would have been in an uh, expanding cap, maybe three point five would have been fine, but who knows where it ends up. Um, Mm -hmm. but, uh, Ginger Wolf asks Cody Coran season. Bring it. Yeah. Bring it. I want to see it. Big booming shot. Give Uh, him a look. I just want to know if Dallas Aikens listens to the pod because he was asked about, uh, Andy Walensky's one timer on, uh, in one of his availabilities. And he said, you know, we just want Andy to let it rip in terms of his, his potent one timer. I think the jokes that we've made have been about Vinny Terry, but it is just funny that this By, this meme is continuing. DB Lowry is asking if Comtois could be a Raquel C, a Raquel type contract. I don't know if I see that much term. I don't see six years going to to Comtois. No, there's no way. No. I, although, I, although, I mean, what did Raquel get in his contract? How many goals did he score in his contract year? Uh, let's see. So, yeah, this is Raquel's second contract. Raquel scored, so let me see. He signed this extension on October 2016, so it would have been the 2015. He had 20 goals uh, in the season prior to yeah. needing the extension. So, I mean, look, like I said, Contois got 13 goals this yeah. year. and uh, Ra- I mean, you... Raquel followed that up with a 33-goal season. Well, that's the thing, and Contois doesn't have um, – actually, no, they were both – they were both second round no, picks. Raquel was a late first or 30th, 30th overall. Raquel okay. was a late yeah. first. Yeah. So, so Raquel had that, had that booster for his contract being a first round pick. Um, he did score 20 goals this season, th- that contract year. Um, but so, if you look again, if you look at Contois production this year, like it's on par with that. Yeah. And, and I mean, this was a situation where Raquel signed that off of his ELC. So but I don't, may, maybe I don't there's a point I, there that, that, that turn that money would match up. But also that was signed in 2016, 2016, October of 2016. So I, I think even then, even since then, contracts have kind of changed a little bit and how their second contracts have kind of changed a little bit. And I think if you're Contois agent, you probably don't want to sign a contract like that because you, you're thinking you, you would rather sign a bridge. Exactly. I think he's a very good candidate for a bridge. And also just with the whole COVID thing, you know, the, the, the flat cap world, I mean, uh, it's probably unlikely that the team would want to commit like that anyway. Ginger Wolf, I think a, a good example of this, he says, would a Comtois contract potentially be like an Andre Kasha second deal, which was three three years at 2.6? I think that might that would make more sense to me than a six-year deal. Mm-hmm. And so... Yeah, it's possible. May, maybe he takes a little bit less money to get a shorter-term contract because he wants to be able to cash in more later. So right now, on an 82-game pace, uh, Comtois is on pace for... Um, 48 points, How roughly. Many goals? Uh, well, I'd have to do that math over, but the year, the year that, uh, Raquel got that contract, he had put up 43 points. <laughs> so 
yeah, like he's he's right there. Yeah, definitely. I'll I'll get that number number shortly. But let's get to this question as I, I, I look that up. Who do you think gets the captaincy at, when Getzloff is no longer on the Ducks? Um, that's a good question. I don't really know the answer to that, to be honest with you. I, if it just depends which, I guess the better question is which group of players will it, will it come yeah. out? Uh, will it be the the kind of veterans? You know, will it be like a Fowler? Or will it go to one of the uh, youngsters? Will it be maybe like a Jamie Drysdale or even a Trevor Zegras? Who knows? Um, I think that that is a question that I'm not so sure about. Because if you'd asked me that a couple of years ago, when the Ducks were still kind of in this fantasy land of being a competitive team, I would have said Cam Fowler. But now with the way things are shifting in the organization, I'm just a little less less sure which direction they go in. So uh, real quick on the goals, I think he's basically exactly where Raquel was at in that year. Yeah. Yeah, no, Raquel had 20 goals in 72 games, which if he had played all 82 would have been 20, 22.77 goals. Comtois, if you prorate his current goal scoring rate over an 82 game season, 22.36. Yeah, so he's going to get he's going to get the Raquel AAV, uh, which uh... unless unless he wants lower term and then it, RFAs are a weird situation where mm-hmm. if you can get more money, if you go for longer term. But if you shorten up that term, you might take less money overall. But there's just no way he's going to... I just don't see a scenario where he's going to ask for longer term. No, I don't either. So, I mean, I could see him getting two two to three mil over three years. Yeah. I mean, I think he's going to get three times three, something in that vicinity. Yeah. And so, real quick, my opinion on the the captaincy. Fire call out is a good point. I always thought because I agreed with I agree with this. I always thought it would be Fowler that would be the captain, but the fact that he hasn't worn an A permanently while Manson and Silverberg have has made him skeptical. I agree with that. I mean, who knows where it goes with the new coaching staff? How that happens? I I always thought Fowler would be a good good point for that. But Fowler is now kind of getting up there in age. I think if you're the Ducks franchise, you want the next captain because I mean at the end of the day the Ducks uh the Ducks haven't had that many captains overall no. in, in the history of the franchise. And I mean it went from uh Scott Niedermeyer. There was one year of Chris Pronger um in there because of Scott Niedermeyer being unknown uh if he would come back and then basically the next year it went back to Scott Niedermeyer and then went to Pronger and prior to that it was Korea for so long. Um yeah. and so I mean I'm looking I think there was one year of Steve Ruchin and so, I mean, the Ducks have had one, two, three, four, five, six. I mean, seven. they've had seven captains over their 25 plus year history. So I think if you're the Ducks franchise, you don't necessarily want to give that to a guy that's nearing or exiting his prime. So I think if you're the Ducks, I mean, you may just say screw it and slap it on Trevor Zegers. I don't. I mean, if, as long as Bob Murray is the GM, I don't think that happens. I, mean, I think they. I think they'd give it to Jamie Drysdale before they give it to uh, Trevor Zegers. Let me think about this. I mean, they gave it. Uh, they gave it. Getzloff was young, but he wasn't that young when they gave it to him. Well, also, again, like Ryan Getzloff, personality-wise, true, play style-wise, not Trevor Zegers. I think and, Trevor. I think Trevor Zegers is the guy that you want as your captain because of how. I mean, this is a, a difference in my opinion versus the uh, organization because yes. I think you're right there. But Trevor Zegers is the guy you want as your captain. You want this guy that's loud and outgoing that. That is the front facing. I mean, at the end of the day, here's what the captain is. He's the face of the franchise. Yeah. A- and, and that's and that's the thing. Yeah. And I think with Zegras, he would thrive in that because he's a guy who invites the spotlight. He's a guy who I think it actually makes him better to have more responsibility, to be empowered. And so I think it would go well that he would probably be my pick. Nothing wrong with Jamie Drysdale, though, as the captain, you know, just kind of that subdued, excellent defenseman wearing the sea. And Zegras can be more of like the 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 yin to his yang, so to speak. Um, but regardless, I just think that they could have a fun leadership group. I, I think with Zegras need- and Drysdale. I think it needs to be someone from that group, though. I, I don't think I it, agree. It, it can't be. I think from the current core, it's age not going to be, and it and it's not going to be from the Jones, Steele, Contois, Terry class. I mean, I could see Terry wearing an A. I agree. Um, because if you listen to his interviews, he's just very well spoken, very thoughtful. Z- and. And maybe some guys are, and they just don't let it on. But he, you can tell with him. Just go full on uh, youth core with your uh, with your captaincies, and go captain Zegris, assistant uh, Jamie Drysdale, assistant uh, Troy Terry. Just go for it. Yeah, you you would love that. Just go for it. You know. Would you buy a Zegris uh, C jersey? The question is, would I get a Zegris C jersey or, or a Terry A jersey? Well, why not both? 
I mean, I could just, yeah. That, Here's that, my that's question. When does Trevor Zegras switch to number 13? When does he get that, that right? Does he get that change? And now we are just fulling full off the rails, but you know, why not? Um, <laughs> does he do that when they call him up next weekend? Oh, wow. So there's a, there's a lot of layers to that, that question. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So first off, you think he's getting called up next weekend, uh, which is slightly bold, slightly bold, uh, but also like they're running out of time to play him at Honda center in front of fans. Uh, no, I will go with no. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I think the, the amount it's of dumb. games left, it, it's dumb though. Just yeah. get him, get him the 13, get him the 13. It'll look so much better. 46 is not his number. Everyone knows that he knows that, um, the so, media knows that like, come on. So he's currently played in, uh, let me see. He's currently played in, I think, what was it? 17 games. Is that right? Uh, so far this year. Uh, yeah, 17 games. So we can play in nine more games this season without having to have them burn the burn the year off the you or waste a, a year of uh, towards his UFA status. Um, mm-hmm. and, and year so, of service. Yeah, year of service. There we go. Um, so yeah, so the game on the 24th against Vegas would be the if you count backwards from the end of the season, that's the ninth game from the end. So mm-hmm. that's the the reverse retro game. <laughs> Tin foil cap. That could be Zegris's recall. That could be his. Uh, just, just give him thirteen. Just give him thirteen in the reverse retro jersey. <laughs> hey, we're doing a watch along that night. We are. There we go, folks. There we go. There you go. The ultimate plug. Watch Zegris wearing thirteen in a reverse retro. You know what's funny? I saw someone tweet this today, and I'm sorry if I'm not giving you the credit, but I thought it was a funny tweet. Maybe it was in our Discord. I don't know. Uh, but someone's saying, you know, for a team that's only wearing the reverse retro twice, the Ducks sure love to advertise it, though. Oh, yeah. We, oh, we get yeah. a ton of ads for it on the broadcast and on social media. I mean, the, um, the Bally Sports crew, I think, knows that it, it it's, a, it's a good promotion. Yeah. But so why is it the team wearing it more than twice? Bob Murray? Yes. I mean, that is the answer to, to all that ails this franchise. Maybe slightly reductive, but. Not all, also not that far from the truth. Yep. So I think that's probably going to do it for us tonight. So yeah, I, I just let let's end it with that bold take that I had. Yeah, you know we'll we'll let you have your moment here, have your shine. Uh, it's important. We'll see if I uh, was right. We'll we'll find out. Everyone... We'll find out in a week if I was right. You've had some you've had some memorable takes on this pod that have ended up being true. I know. Uh, Log- Troy Terry logic. making the team U- using, in like 2018. Use that. That's my that that was my home run bat drop. <laughs> You know, bat, like bat flip. That was everything. That was your, that for, was your Upton. For, for, those, for those that are new to the show, I believe it was like November of what would that have been? The, the 2018 season or yeah. The, so November, it, 2017, I, I said that you, if you want to both take, here's one Troy Terry is going to make his ducks debut this year. Yeah. But that was a pure like heat check. There was just no, there was no basis to that. Yes, there was. The basis was the reason he had just had a great world juniors. He had just been the most productive uh, player for Denver university. So the reason why he went back to college would have been to try to back to back uh, the national championships and to, because he was eligible to play in the Olympics. And so the ducks wanted to badly get him out of Denver university to, or yeah, Denver university to get him on the roster. And so they were willing to burn the year to be able to get him out because if he would have gone back for a senior year, he could have just signed wherever. And so all the signs yep. pointed to it, making sense that he went back for one more year to play in the it's Olympics. It's funny how you have this rationale like memorized. Yeah. Cause it was, <laughs> there was logic behind it all. It wasn't you, you made it sound like it was this heat check, but it's like, no, <laughs> I, there was basis to it. Well, yeah, especially cause they had bur- been burned before. Yeah. In these types of scenarios. Yeah. Uh, Jake Gardner. By the way, M. Young saying, uh, isn't Trevor also known to wear 11? His Twitter handle also has 11 in it. So who knows if we'll choose 13 Ooh. or 11? I hope he goes 11. I think it's classier than so, 13. I mean, we all know why. Well, not maybe everyone. I know why you're saying that. I, I don't know why you're I don't know why you're <laughs> saying that. I don't know why. Why am I saying that? I don't because, know. Because Saku Koivu wore 11. Well, yeah. And I just, I like the number 11. Um, because of Saku sports. Koivu. I love Saku Koivu, correct, it's, it's, as should you, former Duck. Was actually very productive on the Ducks. Yeah. So That wasn't uh, meant to be a shot. It was just an observation. I think it kind of was. I think it, it kind of was. It was just an observation. Uh, but Zegras did wear 13 at, at Boston, and he wore 11 on Team USA 
but he's also worn 13 on Team USA. He's wearing 13 for the goals. Yeah, so I feel like 13 is a likelier than 11. The, I, 11, for 11, in his, the 11 in his Twitter handle is an interesting uh, take. I feel, like, I feel like he's had that. Um, okay, now I'm just very curious. When did he last wear 11? Because I think he wore it at like the U18s or something like that. Uh, elite prospects, please come through for me. Yeah, Trevor Zegras 11 is his Twitter handle, but... I mean, but when did he make his Twitter handle? Because if he made it when he was like 12, you then can I don't change know. your Twitter handle, though. Some guys just don't. Although, I guess if you change your Twitter handle, you lose verification. Oh, he doesn't want to lose the blue check mark. Classic yeah. cocky Zegris. There we <laughs> go. There's the issue there. Okay. Let me see. I really, I badly want to figure this out before we get off, but I, I, I just don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, do, okay. When does it say that he joined Twitter? Find find this out. March of 2014. This this is the the real like investigative journalism that you tune into the Crash the Pond podcast. Yes. Where. So on. Okay, I'm not gonna find it from there. In 2014, <laughs> he made it. Yeah, March of 2014. Okay, so that year he played for the New York Junior Rangers at the Pee Wee level, and what jersey number did he wear? <laughs> Ah, it's it doesn't say it on Elite Prospects. Damn it, Elite Prospects. Damn it. M Young saying his Insta bio is also eleven. Okay, that that does throw a wrench into my <laughs> my argument here, just slightly, just slightly. Let's let's give it one more go here. Avon Old Farm School in the high school prep circuit. We're we gonna get a jersey. Why do the, why don't they have jersey numbers? That's unconscionable that you wouldn't have jersey numbers. Oh well. We're not going to find out. Maybe we'll, maybe one day we'll get Trevor on the pod and we'll ask him. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, why, yeah. why 11? But the thing is, he's here's my issue. I'm young. He's wearing 13 now. Is the, And there, I don't think there's an 11. Is there an 11 on the on the goals? Is it Perot? I don't I don't know. Who knows? Now I we're mean, just now he, we're just spinning around. I mean, you would assume that he would have priority. Yeah, it's Jacob Perot. You would assume that he has priority over Perot. Yes. And they both started the season... They both started the season in San Diego. So maybe they rock, paper, scissors for it. Who knows? Who knows? All right. Hard hitting journalism we... right there. The... Hard hitting journalism. <laughs> I'm so mad because this is, I'm blaming elite prospects here because they should have had jersey numbers from the Quebec Pee Wee tournament in 2014. This is purely on them. Uh... <laughs> All right. Let's wrap, let's wrap this thing, this thing up. <sighs> oh, all right, guys. Well, hey, thanks everybody for listening to this pod. Um, uh, if you're still listening, kudos to you because this is a week with without the the usual. You know, we we've gone from trade deadline to maybe but more back to our oh, roots, wait. back to our wheelhouse. Real quick, uh, quick answer, right here. We didn't do this last episode. Now that we've had a week uh, away, grade for the deadline. No explanation. Just give me a grade. Uh, I'm just gonna go F. Gut gut says F. I'm going D just because it could have been worse. Yeah, I'm going F. Okay, fair it, enough. It's my it's my gut. I don't know. Yeah, no, that I, works. I almost I, I almost said C minus, but I wanted to go hotter and go F. Okay, someone's saying Zegris wore eleven in prep school. How are you getting this information? Because freaking freaking elite prospects doesn't have it. Okay, let me try it. Let me try a quick Google. <laughs> it's still going. I, oh, there it is. A picture of Trevor Zegris for Avon Old Farms <laughs> or Avon Old Farms wearing eleven. Boom. There you go. Now you, now, you can the... ha- now you can have your Pierre Maguire moment. Now we know why he's wearing a lot. Why the, it's the 11 in the, in the, in the handle. Okay. Thank you. Slam dunk the funk for pointing, pointing that out. I think that that really helped. Uh, okay. God, this, that was exhausting. All right, everybody. Well, Jake, is there any, is there anything else we should know about the world of wrestling or just anything, anything that we're missing out on here? I mean, go watch AEW. I'm, I don't really want you're, to talk. Oh, to you're him. you're back to boycotting uh, WWE. Yeah, they're awful. You're they're, they're you're going they're cuts. You're, you you go through phases. I don't. You'll know. you'll be back on the bandwagon. No, shortly. I, it's mania and that's it. But yeah, <laughs> WWE cut a bunch of roster talent due to budget issues, even though they had their most profitable year ever. So really gross, sticky stuff there. AEW, on the other hand, is putting on fantastic shows, paying paying for independent talent to come in and, and do YouTube shows to get them uh, highlighted and put them out. They're doing some great work with uh, the Young Bucks. That match that they had against Phoenix and uh, and uh, Pac was just absolutely insane. And the fact that we got a pay-per-view level quality match on uh, TV, on free TV, 
just just insane and the amount of heel work that they put into that match the amount of character development just just absolutely absolutely great so if you're interested in trying to get back into wrestling if you were like me and was a lax fan i got back in with the becky lynch run into wrestlemania i would highly suggest checking out uh aew it really feels a lot like kind of late 90s early 2000s maybe that's giving it too much high praise but it feels like there, there's this overarching storyline and it feels like it, it's a fun show that gives you good in ring talent story development everything like that so go watch AEW dynamite every wednesday at 8 p.m five pacific oh by the way slam dunk the funk is my good buddy aj from uh, dnvr sports who ah. came up with that quick research so thank you for that i swear that, that i was i was not going to sleep tonight without knowing that okay Thank you, Slam Dunk the Funk. <laughs> All righty. Well, let's get out of here, Jake. Let's just go through our quick plugs here. So if you if you enjoyed tonight's show, um, there's definitely a few ways that you can support us. Uh, go to patreon.com slash crash the pond. For a dollar a month, you get access to our patrons only Discord chat. It's a lot of fun. Uh, you get to connect with other diehard Ducks fans. Uh, for $5 a month, you get access to two bonus episodes where we'll talk about uh, different topics. We'll dial in on the Ducks or we'll go league wide. We'll do rankings. We'll do series predictions. So playoffs are uh, fast approaching. You know, we're about a month away here, uh, thanks to the Canadian division. So, uh, you know, we're we're going to get some pods there. And for $15 a month, you get access to everything I just mentioned. And you also get access to t- uh, two watch alongs a month. So we're actually going to be doing uh, live broadcasts of Ducks games where Jake and I and we actually had CJ on the last pod are going to be giving you an alternate commentary. So if you're maybe a little tired of, uh, you know, Bally slash uh, Fox Sports West, well, there you go. We, we've got you covered. If you enjoyed this little uh, little uh, side thing into Tr- Trevor Zegers' number and trying to figure that out, <laughs> that that's some <laughs> of what you get on that show. Yes, just a lot of a uh, lot of hard hitting, important investigative journalism is is the best way I can put it. Um, yeah, he definitely. Yeah, now I'm seeing a bunch of pictures of them wearing eleven. I, I'm mad I didn't just Google it. Why did I rely on a website <laughs> yeah. when I could have just trusted Google? So mad. Okay. Anyway, never gonna let it go. Um, another another way that you can support us, uh, if uh, you know maybe the funds are a little low or limited, just uh, go search our name on. Uh, on Apple Podcasts, search Crash the Pond and leave us a rating and a review. I don't think we have any new reviews this week, uh, but if you do leave us a review, we will make sure to read it on the show. So whether it's good or bad, uh, whether it's saying that I should be off of the show, we'll still read it. How about that? Um, and of course, if you're not an Apple Podcast, you can follow us or subscribe to us on Spotify. Make sure to follow us on YouTube or subscribe to us there. Um, turn on the notifications. If you leave a comment, very likely that we will engage. Uh, and by we, I mean Jake. But that's what? okay. So, so nothing. So if you enjoy the, uh, if you want to get a video version of this, uh, we've got you covered on YouTube. Jake will upload the, the, the Twitch video. So if you want to see like some of the charts and stuff that we put up during the stream, or see my bright shirt. Yeah, or if you want to see Jake's shirt, if you want to see uh, Salem the black cat, Jake's cat. Well, there you go. You you. I, there's no reason not to go check out the YouTube channel, honestly. Um, outside of that, make sure to check out our website, crashthepond.com. Uh, we've got articles going up, flying left and right. Uh, we've got five takeaways after each Duck series. Sometimes when it's like a one game, a one-off, we'll, we'll maybe try to stack them up together. But we've got five takeaways, so giving you different stats, get different uh, looks at what happened during that series. And we've got recaps after every game. CJ had a good article this week uh, breaking down what happened at the trade deadline. And Jake's always got some good stuff with his takeaways and different articles. Um, check us out on social media. Jake is on Twitter at reindeer games, 91 at crash. The pond is on Twitter and on Facebook. And I'm on Twitter at Felix underscore Sicard. And if you've made it this far, I promised it at the beginning of the show, but I've got an article going up this week at the fourth period. Got to, uh, got to interview Anthony Stolars. So how about that? And uh, we had a good chat, asked him about how he tapes a stick, because, of course, I had to ask that. Um, so if you if you want to see that that hard hitting journalism, go check out the fourth period dot com. <laughs> OK. And, and with that, I think we're going to bid everyone adieu. All righty, folks. Have a good one. Bye.